Um, so my name is Kelsey and I am a consultant at the TTU Undergraduate Writing Center. I've been working in writing centers at various universities for about 10 years now. Um, I'm currently a student in the photography MFA program at Texas Tech. I also have a previous master's degree in English from Illinois State University. So I'm here to talk to you primarily about evaluating sources. And if you do have questions as we go along, you can unmute and feel free to ask or you can put them in the chat. Um, we'll also have a little time at the end to cover those. So as we consider these questions, we're going to get a little bit of help from one of my little sister's favorite TV shows. Um, it's pretty obscure, but you might've heard of it. It's uh, called SpongeBob. Um, so first and foremost, a credible source should have a name on it. Um, so when we look at a source, it helps to just ask who. Who said it or wrote it? Who published it? Who paid for it? Who fact checks it? Who edits it? Who updates it? Who researched it? If a reader comes across something and says, well, who says? Why should I believe that? Why should I trust that? Um, there should be an answer. So like our very enthusiastic little friend, SpongeBob, we should be able to answer that question, whether we're answering me, 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 it's my opinion. These are my ideas. Or whether we're saying it's this particular source who you should trust because of whatever reason, um, we, need, we need to know. So that's first and foremost, very important. Um, so you can think about things like the difference between a peer reviewed journal where educated professionals in a particular field are reviewing the work of other educated professionals in the same field and making sure conclusions are accurate before their information is released to the public versus something like say YouTube where anyone can upload a video at any time and there's often no one who oversees it, who fact checks it or who edits it or who updates it. Um, sometimes there is but there's not a, a review process for that or something that lets us know whether that's taken place. Asking who paid for research or a publication matters because there can be conflicts of interest. If your research is on whether or not something is, you know, soda is healthy and it's being paid for by the Coca-Cola company, that's a bit of a conflict of interest. Um, so you want to be aware of those things for yourself and for your readers or listeners or whatever format you're presenting information in. Asking that matters because many hands may go into the publication of a single story or a video uh, as well. That being said, evaluations are always rooted in context. If your best friend comes up to you and says, I just saw the cutest dog in the entire world, you're probably not going to say, all right, I need your qualifications for how you evaluate cute. I need to know for sure that you've seen every single dog in the world. I need to know your comparison system for that. I need to see a rubric. We're going to need to do <laughs> an external review to make sure it's really the cutest dog. You're probably just going to take their word for it and maybe go see the dog or hopefully they took a picture. Um, but if you want to come across as a professional and you want others to take you seriously when you make claims, making sure you can trust the sources of your information before repeating it goes a long way. So I'm going to need your help for this next slide. Um, we're just going to do a real quick comparison of these websites focused on who. So what's the first one? You can get your information entirely from the screenshot here. What have we got? Uh, the first one looks like Reddit, which is a very um, open forum, I guess you would say. <laughs> yes. Um, and our second one here. It's the uh, TTU webpage. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we know that information? Um, the title at the top of the webpage or also the HTML. I don't know if I can really see the link in this particular screenshot, but yeah, the title at the top. Yeah. So, so we have a lot of good markers that we can pay attention to. Website URLs for sure, um, banners at the tops of pages, um, and those let us know some information about the websites. And we can also use our existing knowledge of those or do additional research to find out who can post to and change the content on those pages. So within Texas Tech, um, certain people within each department have administrator access versus anyone can post a comment on Reddit as long as they have an account. With fact checking, individual departments will set their own standards for data that they publish, but most of those things will be seen and edited by a number of people before being posted versus on Reddit, nobody, or maybe the person making a post did a little research on their own, we hope. Um, so 
when you question reliability there, Texas Tech is, I hope, going to come out ahead. Um, and those are questions that are important when we're evaluating our sources. So moving on, um, dealing with what? We have to ask ourselves, what is the actual content being communicated? What does the way it's written or presented tell us about the publisher? What does it tell us about the creator? What does it tell us about the intended or unintended audience? Um, and what the purpose of that content is? I'm gonna pause this on a funny moment so it isn't annoying, but all right, there. Um, nice grimace. So there are layers and complexities to communication. If I look at, out at you with a furious glare and snarl through clenched teeth, I really care about you. That may be true, but my presentation makes that message come across as unreliable or potentially compromised. So that's why it's important to look at both the actual message of content and how it's being presented. That means paying attention to the publisher, whether that's a blog hosting site that will pretty much let anyone publish anything versus say Penguin Books, where print versions of books are expensive to publish and backed by the name of a publishing house, or even a newspaper where there might be a big difference between what's published on the front page and meant to be factual and what's published in the opinion section. So the way the content is written, whether it's formal language and uses a lot of technical terms or informal language and uses a lot of slang and contractions can also give us indications about what the writer uh, is saying and the reliability of that information. Slang is, a, is an interesting one because it's fun to use but it can exclude people and it ages quickly, which is one of the reasons why it's often shied away from in academic or professional publications. You can think about the difference between calling something like the bee's knees, um, not a super popular phrase anymore, or sweet, which was what my older brother would have gone with, or dope, which is what my younger sister would say, or cool, which was what hit with my generation, or simply calling something popular. Um, we're talking about dank memes. Like we, we all come across these that are kind of culturally tied and relevant, but they really do age people. Um, so all of these choices impact the audience differently and they communicate different things about that creator and about the content. We can also make a distinction between the intended audience and the unintended audience. So most academic journals are writing in that formal language because they're meant to be used professionally, to be read by experts or by students. Newspapers and news channels can be accessed by almost anyone, which is why they tend to write at about a sixth grade level, um, because they're meant to be easy to understand, although they're probably geared towards particular demographics. Even if we look at something like Twitter, an account that's public is going to have a different impact on audience than one that's private. But in any of these cases, something could be screenshotted or shared with someone in an unintended way. Even on something like Snapchat, where stories are expiring, you can still have another person in the room with you. You could still be screenshotting that. So that content, whatever it's presented as, however it's determined that the plan is for it to be viewed, can all have a big impact on what we're seeing. Um, and tell us a lot about the purpose. So we're gonna do a quick comparison. This is one of my favorites. Um, you're gonna notice we've got a bit of a TTU theme here because I read a fair bit about this place that we're all affiliated with in various ways. So what's Raiders report? And you can cheat on this one and read it straight off the screenshot if you want. Looks like an online reporting system for the office of the Dean. Yeah, it sure is. And does anyone know what TTU COVID watch is? Is that one someone that has come across? Okay, so TTU COVID Watch, despite saying TTU on it, is an anonymous, very unofficial Twitter account where people can submit videos and pictures of unsafe parties that tech students attend or reports of students doing COVID unsafe things. Um, and so when we look at our sources, we're looking at what they're publishing to tell us something about them. So Raider Report, you know, we can pay attention to things like the URL and the banner. Um, Raider Report, it's got an official logo. It's hosted by an official site. It's got clear affiliations listed. And uh, on our TTU COVID watch, we have a photo from, I believe, iCarly. Uh, that's 
it's an old Nickelodeon show. <laughs> um, we've got, it looks like photos taken from cell phones of various parties. Uh, so we're dealing with a major difference in credibility here. Although these both technically have fairly similar purposes. They're to give a way for students to anonymously call out bad behavior. They're a way for concerned people to deal with their concerns. Both of them say TTU. But the big difference is that one is official and publicly available and formal, and the other is unofficial and private and uses a lot of memes and informal language. One might result in official action. Um, it can genuinely change the culture of the university. And the other one pretty much just names and shames people. So those are things to think about when you consider intended audience and what the minor things about our source, like where we're finding them and what they're presenting themselves as, can tell us about them. So moving on to talk about when and where, our friend SpongeBob here in the top is um, muttering and hooting because he's meant to be from a more primitive time. Uh, your source probably shouldn't be. We'll start there. Um, unless you're using a primary source from a particular period, when and where are about context too. So in the humanities and arts, we use sources that are often hundreds and hundreds of years old. We're dealing primarily with ideas and some of those haven't really changed over time. Although some have, um, but in the sciences and technology, information gets outdated very quickly. So your when is going to be really important if you're in one of those fields. That's why you see things like MLA in your in-text citation, you're not gonna include a date, but in APA, which is often used in the sciences or Chicago style, those dates are gonna be front and center. Um, so if you tell your professor something like, this patient is suffering from irritable moods because his spleen is causing unbalanced humors, you're probably gonna get laughed out of the classroom. Um, you're not gonna be taken seriously as a diagnostician because that information has been outdated for a long, long time. Um, there's also a big difference between an original publication date and when things are updated, especially online. If a web date site hasn't been updated since 1980, there's a good chance that information is no longer reliable. If the copyright hasn't been updated since 2019, even though that's only a couple of years ago, that can be reason for concern. The reliability of a, about the reliability of a website that's not even being maintained anymore. So dates for articles or postings, they're typically at the top or the bottom of the page. Dates for books are usually within the first few pages. Dates for videos usually the bottom of the video in a description, um, but you can also look uh, in the uh, embedded data there if you usually right click on a photo and, and go into info, although there are ways to hide that information and further ways to ferret it out if you need it. The library can help you more with that um, because it is a more involved process if you really need to track down when a video appeared. So context informs where we see things too. Um, in our meme here, we've got SpongeBob being yelled at and told to go back to work. They're at his workplace. That's typically where he's being scolded about work, at work. Um, creators make decisions about where to seek publication, whether that's their personal website, social media, a major news publication, an online only publication or a print publication. Things can also be republished or shared on places other than the original location, which we see a lot on things like Facebook particularly if it was republished on social media, it might be taken out of context, attributed mistakenly, or something might even be published and attributed to a source that never said it. Um, so there's always this kind of chain of evidence when we're dealing with sources and we have to pay attention to that and often play detective a little. So we've got another quick comparison here. Um, let's take a look at when and where these were published. So you can pull straight from the screenshots. Um, so when were these published or copyrighted? It's kind of hard to tell, but I think the official website, I see February 1st, 2021, I think, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got on the official website a 2021 copyright at the bottom here. Um, and it looks like it was originally published September 2nd, 2020. 
versus our Twitter page where there was a tweet 11 hours ago uh, at the time I took the screenshot and there's a pen tweet from February 26th, 2020. So we know that it's being updated very frequently right now um, for both of these, but also that there's older information on here. But because the website is being consistently maintained, we know that someone is still periodically looking at that older information, or at least we have a good indication that they are. So we've got our official Undergraduate Writing Center Twitter page. Follow us. Um, and we've got the official website, which is a great place to go if you want resources or handouts. Um, I think that's about as hammy as my self-promotion is going to get, so you won't have to endure more of that. So our, our last major question here is why? So SpongeBob goes with, it's not about winning, it's about fun. Um, and sometimes that's the case. Um, but sometimes we have to ask, you know, why did the creator publish it? Why would a publisher back it? Why should an audience look at it? Why should they trust it? Why is it useful to you? As a creator, why is it useful to your audience? Why this source instead of another one? Motivations matter. It comes back to context. A shocking revelation can make a really great element on a TV show, but it's not very desirable as the last sentence of a news article because there's no time to explain what the audience needs to know about the revelation, to look at the context. Um, so who, what, when, and where are all factors that help us to understand why a piece of content is appearing in front of an audience. There's a lot of false information and wide circulation, and that has real consequences. It's important to take responsibility for our role in the chain of evidence and to not pass on sources that cannot be verified or that were published for malicious purposes. And that's where that why is really important. Your audience depends on you to check sources that they may or may not ever look up and read themselves. So that's a lot of responsibility. So remember to pay attention to that who, what, when, where, and why as you're evaluating sources. So in the future, if someone asks you if you know how to evaluate a source, you like Plankton can say, I'm so big and smart um, and use these simple questions to start evaluating them. Um, questions, things I can help you guys with. I got one for you, Kelsey. Have you ever had uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, so to say? Uh, some kind of source that it's supposed to be credible, but then you just, something raises a red flag for you, and then you just have to change your opinion about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we do run across those. I think one of the more common scenarios for that is with books sometimes. Um, I think we have a tendency to assume that anything that people went to the trouble to put it, a binding on and put out is going to be, you know, edited and quality. Um, that's not always the case, especially now that it's very easy to self-publish um, and there are a lot of small presses. So you're going to need to pay attention to things like whether the author is citing their sources, um, whether they're leaving that little paper trail, those elements of documentation. Um, and often you're going to need to check your sources sources, um, which can feel a little bit like kind of chasing your own tail sometimes, but it is about that responsibility that we have to our audiences to make sure that what we're saying is true. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? You can feel free to put them in the chat too. Uh, let's see, I see another one here. So how can we tell if someone who shared something correctly sourced it? The internet search the alleged source and see if there's evidence of them saying that. Yes, that's one way you can definitely do it. Um, things can be deleted on the internet, which can cause a certain ambiguity. Um, you can use things like uh, the Wayback Machine is one that comes to mind immediately as well, uh, that archive internet content um, there's another one for like front pages that I'm not coming up with the name of right off the top of my head, but in general, there are internet archive machines that can let you see those. Uh, President Trump's tweets come to mind right now since he's not on Twitter anymore. There are several archives that make those publicly available now. So you don't have to trust just on personal screenshots, which can be doctored and edited in various ways. I'm checking out other questions in the chat here. 
How can we distinguish between levels of credibility of academic journals? That's a fantastic question. Um, that's going to be field specific in a lot of ways. Um, some journals are expected to be read by a more general audience. Some are more targeted to researchers within the field. Um, something you can do if you know the field fairly well is look at scholars you trust and see where they're publishing. You can also speak with your professors or other people who you value their opinion and their expertise and find out which journals they recommend. Um, some of that's also just going to be awareness, um, looking and seeing which sources get consistently um, cited. There are websites who, I'm trying to come up with the name off the top of my head, uh, but they, they track the number of references that a, that a particular paper has had. That is a popularity ranking. That's not always perfect. But if a source is being repeatedly cited, that can sometimes be an indication that it's having a big impact on a particular field. And that's something you can look for too. Um, the websites that do that are field specific. So although I'm still not coming up with the English paper one I'm thinking of, it's going to matter for your field that you look at this, that specific um, area. Let's see. I'm flipping through more chat messages. Yes, you can definitely contact a source and directly ask them um, if you have access to the source. That's sometimes the difficulty if we're dealing with public figures or we're dealing with someone who's died. Um, that's something that historians deal with a lot more because they have to find ways to authenticate and verify older materials. Um, and there are whole fields of study dedicated to that kind of textual criticism. When was it changed? Where was it changed? Who changed it? Was it the publisher? Was it the original author? Um, and if this original author changed it or deleted it, how seriously do we take that? Well, that depends on our purposes and why we're looking at, at it in the first place. Um, so those are going to be questions that vary a lot from situation to situation. Oh, Google Scholar keeps up with those citation numbers. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, yes, that's all excellent, guys. How do we discuss impact factor and how to access it? I've searched it before, but found different numbers on different pages. That's true. Um, and I think that's a, a valid question. So in like, film scholarship, we would call that like a reception study. Um, Uh, if you want to look more at like theory and scholarship on that topic, uh, it's something that you can do. That's all down to who is receiving it and how are they receiving it. You can look at things like Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> it's an easy one that comes to mind, right? They're, they're an aggregate site, but they also host comments that anyone can post. So they'll pull in numerous reviews of a particular uh, piece of media and they give, you know, splat or um, a nice graphic of various kinds that tell how that's generally being received. Um, when you're looking at impact factor within a particular field, it gets more complicated. Um, I think looking, Sava suggested at those Google Scholar numbers is a, is a good solid way to look at that. But I don't think reception studies are as common in other fields. Um, so that might be a, a discipline specific question to chat with your professors about. Um, yeah, a, a TTU librarian would be another good source for that. Um, it's always difficult to say, how are people responding to this? Because we have to ask, well, which people? Whose opinions are we valuing? If it's being cited a lot by students, that might be because it's simple. If it's being cited a lot by top scholars, that might be three people who are citing it, but they're all people who matter a lot um, for that particular branch of information. Uh, any other questions? And if not, Dustin, do you wanna go ahead and throw in that link to the survey? Hey everybody, there's the link to the survey. <clears throat> um, if you could take just a couple of minutes to fill that out, that would be fantastic. Uh, thank you, Kelsey, for 
all the fantastic information about evaluating sources. Yeah, and just to throw in another like kind of two cents about the, the final topic we were talking about, kind of another example that I heard um, in the graduate school, uh, talking to, uh, listening to a panel of professors talking about publication. So if you're thinking about things like impact factor in like science, for example, like if you're a biologist, if you can get published in one of those top tier journals like Nature or Science, that's like fantastic because so many people read those, right? But are you necessarily reaching the audience that you're trying to get to with those? If you have some very specific uh, research that you know the people that I want to be reading this research all publish in this certain smaller, lower tier journal, you can also think about the impact on that. And I realize this is getting really murky and I'm not really answering the question, just muddying the waters more, but it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. But yeah. yeah. Now, I think that's a really useful contribution, Dustin. I have a friend who's a philosopher. Um, yeah, that's a job that still exists. <laughs> and one of her difficulties is, is in tenure review, she does a fair amount of public writing and speaking, and that is weighted as significantly less valuable for her field than formal writing is. And they're considering altering that within her particular university structure, um, because that, that philosophical writing that has a more general audience can have a pretty substantial impact and they want to change how they value that. Um, so lots of options and possibilities, context, always. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for taking the survey. Um, and I know people have got to head out. We're running a little bit long. If you do have any further questions, feel free to email the Writing Center or, or set up a meeting. We love to talk about this stuff. Um, and I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelsey. That was fantastic. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a good day. Bye. Bye, guys.